All right, folks, get ready for a talk on serverless by Brian LaRue. He came from our upstairs neighbor of Vancouver, Canada. Hey, many Canadians in the house. And his LinkedIn profile really gave me a chuckle. It's got, <laughs> you look so scared. <laughs> it's on your LinkedIn. It's got benevolent dictator at LinkedIn Fun the Linux Foundation. True. Principal Space Lord at Adobe. That happened. And your time at Response Tech dominated in foosball. I'm still really good. Yes. <laughs> oh, so many incredible credentials and so humble. <laughs> and I asked him if somebody recognizes him on the street, what would it be for? And his answer is, hopefully not. Let's give it up for Brian. <laughs> Awesome, thank you so much for having me. So we're gonna do a fairly quick tour of uh, modern JavaScript and how it relates to serverless and what that's got to do with us as front-end developers. I'm Brian, I'm a co at begin.com, an AWS serverless hero. I work on an open source framework called arc.codes. At the last Cascade AJS, I presented about enhance.dev, which is a web component framework, and uh, some links, you can find me online all over the place. Okay, modern JavaScript. But let's go back first. Let's go back right to the beginning. So this nerd is Brandon Ike, and he created JavaScript uh, in 10 days with no coffee. And then they called it JavaScript. I know, I was like, how? He's like, Coca-Cola. <laughs> so there was caffeine involved. This is me in 1996, and uh, this is when I was learning uh, web development at the very, very beginning. There, JavaScript existed at this point, but I don't think I was very aware of it and didn't really care. I was actually really hype on Flash, uh, if you remember that animation tool. It was so cool back then. You could like animate things and it looked awesome. And I worked at Little Caesars Pizza and I think there's like stains on that shirt. Saved up for a copy of Hot Metal Pro so I could like code HTML in all caps. It was awesome. <laughs> Little did I know that would turn into a job. Um, 97, I don't know if you remember this, uh, might predate your birth, but uh, we had streaming music. This was what Spotify looked like back then. Um, also, external style sheets became a thing. We used to do these giant font tags to like style our content in line, and we realized that was a really bad idea. So we moved over to style sheets. 98, uh, AOL buys Netscape. Mozilla's launched. Everybody's talking about open source, and Microsoft kind of becomes the bad guy this moment. Uh, they realized they were late to the web, and uh, Bill Gates wrote a memo that they were going to come dominate it, and it famously became known as the Embrace, Extend, Extinguish uh, strategy. <clears throat> In 99, um, this was actually probably my favorite web browser, which is really weird to say. This was an exciting time. We could do really cool stuff with this thing, and like when this happened, this was like state of the art. Like this, this was like ex good when it happened. Obviously, later on, it was maligned a lot, but at the time it was cool. This thing called XML HTTP request was a part of it, and I want you to pay special attention to how they capitalize that because it'll drive you insane for the rest of your life. Um, <laughs> this was when everybody was really excited about like what was going to happen with .com. Spoiler, it completely crashed and was done a year later. It's funny how those hype cycles work. This is when Flash 5 came out. Flash 5 was dope. It introduced a thing called ActionScript 1, and that was actually JavaScript. And for most JavaScript developers at this time, I think we were learning ActionScript, actually. So then in 2001 happened, IE6 came out, and uh, this, was, this was not good. This was actually a sad moment. When this happened, the browser wars were over, Microsoft won, uh, everyone's using IE now. Um, JSON was actually introduced in this year, but nobody cared because everybody was writing XML on purpose and liked it. And um, <laughs> interestingly, this is when C Sharp also happened. 2002, Flash MX came out. This was the coolest thing ever. And this was, at this time, you would literally buy software in a box and like put a CD into a drive. And that's what happened. Also, JIRA happened that year. Super sad year. <laughs> 2003, this is very stagnant, right? Like, nothing's going on. The browser hasn't changed. The capabilities are all the same. Um, ActionScript 2 drops. And if you take a look at ActionScript 2, you'll realize, disturbingly, it's actually TypeScript. It really is. It's identical. 
Um, this is when progressive enhancement was coined. The idea is that you would have working HTML, but it might be OK to use a little bit of JavaScript to make the page better. This was racy at the time. People didn't like JavaScript. It was generally maligned. And so like, this idea of using it was like, pretty dramatic. Like, if you said, oh, I'm going to write some JavaScript, people would be like, why? <laughs> this was not a cool thing back then. 2004 totally changes everything. This idea of Web 2.0 is, is like, kind of coming to the fore. Gmail launches, Flickr launches. People are like, wait a minute, maybe JavaScript isn't totally lame. Dojo framework happens. Dojo, at this time, had components. It had docs. It had basically everything. The joke used to be Dojo already did it. Um, also at this time, Flex framework drops, which is like the Flash equivalent to uh, modern kind of frameworks at the moment. Also, prototype JS happened, which was the first DOM framework. And it was a really bad idea. You would manipulate the prototype. It would be global, and uh, problems happened. We learned that one over and over again, though. OK, 2005, Google Maps happens, and people are stunned. They're like, whoa, whoa, maps in a web page, and you can like, use your mouse with them. This is when AJAX gets coined as a term standing for asynchronous JavaScript and XML, which really dates it, because like, people still weren't doing JSON yet, believe it or not. MooTools happens, and then Adobe acquires Macromedia, which at that moment, we all kind of knew. Like, we knew what was going to happen once Adobe got their hands on it. 2006, jQuery happens, kind of as a response, in a way, to the prototype programming that was going on. Also, YUI happens. And this is like, a, yeah, YUI was rad. Uh, YUI still has, I think, some of the best docs out of like, any JavaScript framework to date. Um, at this time, also interestingly, we got our first IE release in five years, six years, something like that. Yeah, 2001, 2006. Those were dark years. Not a lot happened, but finally, because Firefox, which most people didn't think would work, started to work. And people were like, this is good, and it had dev tools and all kinds of stuff. Firebug, Firebug yes. OK, 2007, iPhone gets announced. And this kind of gets washed over by history, especially Apple. But uh, Steve Jobs said on stage, you're going to build apps, and you're going to use web technology. And everyone booed. And so <laughs> I didn't. I was like, that's awesome. And everyone's like, are you crazy? Uh, OK, so XJS also happened at this time. And to me, this is, this is the line in the sand. This is when modern JS happened, around this time. OK, 2008, things start exploding. Chrome happens. Android happens. PhoneGap happens to mitigate all that mess. Um, mobile web starts ushering in the SPA era. I always hear people talk about SPAs like they were some foregone conclusion. No one wanted to write an SPA, but as soon as we saw what like, transitions were like on a 3G connection on a small phone, we were like, this is bad. we got to do something about this. That's when SPAs became kind of more of a, a thing. 2009, this might be like the golden era of JavaScript. Suddenly, it was cool. It had never been cool before. If you met other people that did JavaScript, you'd have to like, slowly figure it out with each other. You couldn't like, come out and say it. Um, <laughs> You wouldn't admit that at first. You'd be like, oh, yeah, I don't mind it. Oh, I don't mind it either. Um, so yeah, we had JSConf, which was incredible. Node.js gets released later that year at JSConf EU. Angular, Backbone, um, Jekyll, and static site generators. This is 2009. Um, JQ Touch, which was incredible. CoffeeScript, which paved the way for ES6. And then, in my opinion, the pinnacle of mobile design, the Palm Pre and Palm Web OS. This device was fucking gorgeous. And <laughs> seriously, the minute we got border radius, drop shadows, and gradients, you best believe we used the shit out of that. Because <laughs> we didn't have that before. Look at that, though. It's beautiful. 2010, Ember.js launches, and Steve Jobs just nukes Flash from orbit, like completely destroys it with a letter. It was crazy. That was it. He wrote a letter, and everyone's like, well, I guess we're not doing Flash anymore. That's just uh, it's, Steve said no. It's over. So there was this idea of callback hell. We were blaming the syntax. It's the syntax's fault that we've got these continuation passing going on. So Chris Caldwell comes up with this idea of a promise. 
2011, Narco.js, Meteor.js, and Bootstrap come out. We got all kinds of ways to create DOM elements now. 2012, it accelerates. We see the first Cascadia JS. Woo! Batman JS, that's a thing. <laughs> Shopify did that. Sammy JS, Durandal. I went to this weird, kind of like uh, almost esoteric conference in Aarhus in Denmark. Anders Hedgelsberg's there, and he's launching TypeScript. And it was amazing. I was like, wow, that's really cool. And he's like, yeah, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Worked out. Um, responsive design also gets coined, and this is a, an extension of progressive enhancement where we start thinking about things from a mobile-first perspective and then add the desktop after so we get the best of both worlds. And Promise really starts to take off at this point. I think there were about two dozen different implementations of it. None of them had a proper stack trace, but people were into it. And it was going to fix callback hell. 2013, React launches. Most people didn't like it. Oriella happens. Obviously, React picked up steam later. Um, Vue.js in 2014, Riot.js in 2014. 2015, Angular 2.0 happens. The only reason I'm bringing up Angular again is because people got super pissed about this one. It was all breaking changes. Angular was like, hey, everybody, you get to rewrite your app. Unplanned work. Congratulations. You're welcome. Polymer project happens to start fleshing out what we were going to do about uh, native uh, web components, and the idea, I, I can't even believe we got to 2015, we didn't have modules yet. This is like kind of incredible. The, they did finally kind of get going this year. Um, 2016, Jamstack gets coined by Netlify. Basically, they rebranded st st static site generators. Uh, dynamic import lands, I, I thought this was hilarious because the original idea of import was to be asynchronous, but then they had to do dynamic import OK, whatever. Um, chatbots had a moment in 2016. Everyone thought chatbots would be a thing, but that fell apart. Um, Svelte's introduced. Inferno's introduced. Next.js is introduced. I love Next logo because it's got lots of sharp edges, and they're all seemingly going in different directions. <laughs> 2017, Nuxt gets introduced. Node.js finally gets ES module support behind a flag. Um, and they adopt open governance. And this is a big thing, because finally Node could be depended on. I think before this, it was kind of like a little bit dodgy. You didn't really know where Node was going. It was kind of proprietary. It kind of wasn't. It wasn't always shipping on a regular cadence. They finally had LTS, so this was good. And then we get async await, because of course, promise hell. <laughs> it's, it's the syntax is the problem. Trust me, bro. One, one more syntax. OK, 2018, Microsoft buys GitHub, disturbing. Stencil.js, Gatsby.js. Dino uh, launches, and it's written in Go. Um, Lit spins out of the Polymer project uh, because uh, they wanted a more kind of like lightweight, direct way to do web components. It's still a great library. Um, 2019, Sapper uh, gets released for like a server-side render kind of thing for um, Svelte.js, and Redwood.js gets announced. Yay, <laughs> Sapper and Redwood, yes. Um, 2020, Microsoft buys NPM now. OK. Really dependent on them a lot. Um, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Remix launches. Remix is awesome. I was an early supporter of that. Uh, I got the jacket. Um, Veet launches. And nothing else happened in 2020. <laughs> nothing. 2021, SolidJS, QuickJS. Dino goes 1.0, and it's written in Rust now, because of course it fucking is. 2022, Astro, SvelteKit decides to deprecate Sapper because they want to do the Cloud Functions thing, which is cool. I'm into that. Cloudflare ships Worker D, which is like a, a JavaScript runtime for the back end, and Enhance.dev launches. 2023, Bun happens. That's kind of cool. Chatbots appear to be back now for some reason. And um, Alex Russell pens a very dramatic blog post called The Market for Lemons. Now, in this, it's, it's a... It's a bit uh, spicy, but I think it's worth reading. These are all links, so you should check it out if you haven't. The thing I want you to note about Alex Russell's writing is he attacks ideas, not people. So if you get offended, don't. What do we learn from all this? Well, we got a lot of ways to manipulate the DOM, which is great. I think that means that we have a lot of choices. We have a lot of diversity. We have a super productive community. 
And we've also learned that browser capabilities tend to push new frameworks out. So as the browser improves, old frameworks um, kind of go out and new ones come in, and, and that's healthy. That's good. That's better than stagnation. That's a lot better than waiting on the Flash player to update. OK, let's talk about serverless. So first of all, serverless is not a particular technology framework vendor tool or billing model. Serverless is an ethos. It's a, it's a way to think about how you're working and building your software. The idea is that you want to focus on your value, which is the code you're writing, and you outsource everything else. If your core business value isn't racking servers, you shouldn't be exposing yourself to that work. You should just hire that out. That's the idea. Anybody know who this guy is? Nobody? Look at this stud. That's, that's John McCarthy. He created a thing called Lisp and Lambda Calculus, functional programming as we know it. He's sitting at an IBM 7000, which is the first computer that didn't use vacuum tubes playing chess against the goddamn thing. It was the size of a room. Um, he also coined uh, cloud computing before cloud computing. He, he proposed the idea of time sharing or utility compute. It's an incredible link here. You can read the whole thing. It's a kind of like, it was 1961. So it's a bit wordy. I just ripped out the part that mattered. Every subscriber only needs to pay for the capacity that they use. Uh, they have access to all the programming characteristics of a large system. And it's the cloud. So cloud actually has roots in functional programming uh, back in the 60s. Super weird. All right, let's get back to serverless. So 2000, it, serverless is fairly recent, but the, the concepts and the primitives are actually pretty old now. It might even be considered boring software. A lot of it was driven by Amazon, because they're kind of the big cloud host, um, but not just Amazon. But way back in 2006, we got S3, SQS. S3 lets you store blobs or static assets. You don't think about servers, but they do. And they got a lot of them. <laughs> Apparently, it's the largest microservices architecture in the world. Uh, they also launched SQS, which is like a queue for throttling. Sometimes when we use queues on our own systems, we do it to like, protect our resources. But nowadays, we mostly use queues to uh, handle uh, upstream things. Like if I have to call the GitHub API, I'll get rate limited if I make more than one request per second. So if I have an application that has to make 10 requests, and I do all 10, nine are going to fail. So I put a queue in front of that, and I'll queue them one at a time. It won't fail. 2011, uh, CloudFormation launches. CloudFormation's a declarative way to provision resources. Um, it sounds nerdier than it is. It's actually really, really useful and nice and definitely a, a key component of a serverless architecture. And we're going back over a decade here. 2012 DynamoDB comes out. DynamoDB is a key, wide column key value store. No matter how much data you give it, the query uh, latency stays the same, roughly 10 milliseconds. That's incredible. Any other re relational database system, pretty much impossible to make that claim. You don't have to think about servers. It just does it. 2014, uh, Lambda happens. This is a big deal. Amazon saw uh, customers doing a pattern. They were all uploading stuff to S3, and then they had a polling EC2 service that would look for new items in the bucket, and if it found new items, it would do something like resize an image. And they were like, well, you know, that's, that's pretty wasteful. 24-7, just polling this bucket. What if we send an event and ran that code for you? And they launched it, and a lot of people were like, huh, what if you did that for other stuff? That would be kind of neat. 2015, I had my jaw on the floor. So at this time, I was working on Creative Cloud at Adobe, and uh, that's a very large set of services, a lot of servers. Um, you can't have downtime. You don't want to be the guy that failed, so you over-provision capacity. You don't put up a VPS in a professional setting. You put up two or three, ideally, in different regions. And so if one goes down, the other two are going to be able to handle traffic. That's the minimum. And that's a slow deploy, by the way, because you've got to roll through each one of those to update it. API Gateway launches, they take a little like five-line function that says, hello world. They deploy it, and then he hits it from an, an HTTP endpoint. And my mind was just like, it's like that's it. That's what we're going to do from now on. We're not going to load balance servers anymore. We're going to use something like that. They also launched SNS support, which is a way to do broadcast or fan out. And uh, serverless framework is released, which is 
kind of a che cheesy name for a framework. Um, 2016, Azure gets involved. They launch Azure Functions. Uh, Zeit does a thing called serverless Docker, where you can just give them a Docker file, and they'll let you uh, build that out. And OpenJS Architect's released, which I worked on. 2017, Google Cloud Functions comes to the party. Cloudflare Workers launches. 2018, Azure Durable Functions launches, which is a way to sort of do orchestration or workflows. Netlify Functions launches. Lambda Layers, which is a way to do uh, binary stuff in your Lambda function. And API Gateway WebSockets. Like, this is incredible. We can do stateless WebSockets. If you've ever had to stand up a WebSocket server, you know how hard that is. It takes a ton of memory. Every connection is live. Restarting it's really hard. Load balancing across many is really, really hard because you have to have sticky sessions. So it's a, it's a mess. API Gateway WebSockets, you give it three Lambda functions. Uh, connect, disconnect, and default for message. That's it. Three functions. You got WebSockets that can scale up to millions of users. Like That's a big lift. 2019, uh, provision concurrency drops. The idea of provision concurrency is I can keep some Lambdas warm. This isn't such a big deal anymore, but cold starts used to be a pretty big problem. Um, and then Zeit announces that they're going to sunset their uh, Docker thing, and they move over to Cloud Functions. This made some people mad, but I think it was the right move. 2020, Fastly Computed Edge launches. Finally, we get SQS FIFO support. FIFO means first in, first out. Uh, queues are useful. Queues that can maintain order are more useful. <laughs> That's basically it. And, uh, and this was kind of uh, glossed over, but we used to have per second billing. But today, we now have per millisecond billing. That's incredible. 2021, we get container support. I don't really care about this personally. I'm not running my own custom Linux distros, but if you are, cool, I guess. Um, 2022, we get Lambda Snap Start. People complain about cold starts, and they're like, my, my function took 200 milliseconds. Well, check out how long Java takes. <laughs> <laughs> they think that's fast. Anyways, Snap Start's only for Java. We probably don't need it in JavaScript land. And uh, Workers gets, uh, gets some state persistence uh, toys. 2023, Dino Deploy launches. And uh, serverless, at this point, is now considered boring technology. But really interestingly, um, let's see if Datadog loads. Oh, I did a bad. I'm not doing that. So I got a link in there to Datadog report. But they, they discovered that. Um, serverless adoption is being driven by front-end developers uh, by a wide margin, which is very fascinating. So I want to take a step back for a second, way back. So maybe 20,000 years ago, humans harnessed fire. Maybe. It could have been a little bit farther back, but it's something like that. And humans or sapiens have been around for like a million years. So for like a million years, we're running away from fires and scared of it didn't harness it, didn't control it. And uh, then we, we do manage to do it 20,000 years ago, roughly. What we do know for sure is that we only harnessed electricity 200 years ago. That's pretty lame. Because like, we're not that, you know, like we're pretty smart, right? Like we, we'd like to think we are, but it took us that long. And the reason why was because people started asking tough questions. And so it's OK to ask tough questions. It's OK to challenge ideas. Just want to throw that out there. We're seeing shifting responsibilities right now um, in the broader landscape of the world. Front end is taking over back end. This is becoming a thing. And I think it's an awesome thing uh, for all of us. It's a huge opportunity. Um, weirdly, CSS is taking over for JavaScript. Yeah. You guys have noticed that? It's a thing. Like Rachel's talk sort of shows it. I, I'm stoked. I love it. Um, and another thing that's worth noticing is that uh, when I went through all that stuff, it's very easy to think, wow, this is so overwhelming. No wonder there's JavaScript fatigue. No wonder people are so like, like overwhelmed by how crazy everything is. Everything's always changing. It's, it's worth noticing that nothing's breaking here. Node didn't break. Browsers don't break. AWS doesn't break. It's dependencies that break, and not all of them. So you got to be good about what you choose there. It's a poor craftsman who blames his tools. Um, Cool. That's my recap of what happened in the last 20 years. Uh, if you're doing any AWS stuff, uh, check out these links. And uh, otherwise, I'm looking forward to just enjoying this conference with you all. Thank you. Thank you.